This is on assignment. Hello and welcome to On Assignment, I'm Imran Siddiqui. And I'm Alex Villarreal. In today's episode, the gay marriage debate heats up in the US and Europe. We'll track the issue on both sides of the Atlantic. The mobile phone turns 40 years old, and my, how the device has changed. Scientists say they have nailed down the elusive Higgs boson particle, but what does the discovery mean? And later, when a documentary becomes a court case changer. Bringing you the stories behind the stories, On Assignment is next. The United States is not the only country engaged in the emotionally charged debate over same-sex marriage. The issue has also divided many European countries, including France and Britain. VOA's Henry Ridgewell in London and Kate Woodsum here in Washington have been following the developments, and Alex talked with them to find out more. Let's take a look at that. So, Kate, the U.S. Supreme Court is currently considering two cases related to gay marriage, and you actually had the opportunity to be outside of the Supreme Court on the day that the first arguments began. What was the scene like? Um, Same-sex marriage in the United States is a very divisive issue, and so the scene outside the court was equally as divisive. There were people with signs, banners um, for both in support of same-sex marriage and against. And what was particularly striking to me was that active debates were taking place right on the steps of the Supreme Court. You had, you had camps for both sides who were exercising their freedom of expression in support of, of their values, essentially. And um, people were camped out. There, there were people who had been sleeping there all night long and planned to sleep there again because they wanted to get into the court to hear what many consider to be a historic moment. I want to bring Henry into the conversation now. Henry, uh, you know, of course, the United States is not the only place where we're talking about these issues and this debate over gay rights. So what's been happening lately in Europe? That's right. The gay marriage debate has been top of the agenda in, in many European countries for some time now, um, the, especially at the moment in France, where a bill which would allow same-sex marriages is being debated as we speak by the French Senate, having uh, already been passed by the lower house. Um, that debate in the Senate is expected to last several days. Also here in Britain, uh, the, the upper house of parliament, the Lords, is also debating a same-sex marriage bill. That bill also having been passed in the lower house of, of parliament here. Now, Kate, to address um, the U.S. side of things. One of the comparisons that people are making is um, gay marriage is essentially the same as interracial marriage. And in this country, um, race relations have been extremely controversial, as you know. Um, and one of the couples that were standing outside of the Supreme Court were holding a sign up that said, um, not long ago, our marriage was illegal. Um, as a journalist, covering an issue like this, which is so divisive, of course, um, we as journalists, we have to be unbiased and present both sides equally. But what kinds of uh, sensitivities does that bring up in you when you're covering an issue like this? Um, obviously, as, as a person, as a citizen yourself, there are opinions that you yourself would have. So how do you balance uh, those two sort of responsibilities that you have? Yeah, it's it's a good question. It, you know, it's it's a it's a subject that it's very difficult to be neutral on, and, and I guess uh, you know not not really right to be neutral on. As a, a father myself, I, I, I'm married, and uh, you know you, you bring your own personal viewpoints um, in, into these into these situations. Um, uh, one particularly difficult aspect of the debate um, that, that I've been wrestling with really was when I reported from France, and one of the central uh, tenets of that debate there is, is uh, as Kate mentioned, it is the adoption of children. And I wonder, Kate, whether you, you found that issue is, is sensitive as well in the States, whether the adoption of children has been central to the, de the debate there. The adoption of children hasn't come up as much as it has in France. And as you were talking about earlier, you have sort of religious camps who advocate in support of traditional marriage between a man and a woman and feel that the institution was brought into being to sort of protect the process of having children. Where I found the conflict most for me was in, in the divide between my two identities of being a private citizen and a public record keeper. Um, during the, the throes of the Supreme Court debates, Facebook turned red and there were 
um, thousands and thousands of people who change their profile pictures to a small red square with an equal sign in the middle, and it, that has become a symbol of the gay rights movement. Um, and I saw friends and family and some colleagues change their profile picture, and I was inclined as well to take a stance on the issue. Um, but I couldn't, because as a journalist, you can't put your opinion out there, even on Facebook. At least VOA's policies prohibit us from expressing views on controversial issues. And we look forward to more insights on this issue from VOA's Kate Woodsome and reporter Henry Ridgewell in London. We're taking a break now. Coming up, the cell phone. It's now 40 years old, slimmer than ever, and far from over the hill. You're watching on assignment. April 3rd marked 40 years since the first call using a mobile phone. In 1973, Motorola engineer Martin Cooper made the call from 6th Avenue in New York. Ten years later, the first portable phone was on the market for a whopping $4,000. Well, Rick Panaleo joins us now for more on the remarkable history of the cell phone. Rick writes VOA's Science World blog. Thank you so much, Rick, for being well, on the show. Great to be here again, Alex. So it's very interesting. In 1973, Motorola thought that cell phones would only have a major use by businesses, but mm -hmm. we can see that that was very much wrong. Uh, well, like all good things in the past, you know, the, the best is yet to come. Uh, but it's interesting, you mentioned $4,000. Now, that's just for the phone itself, but you had to also pay a $50 per month service fee, plus you had per minute charges, which were 45 cents during peak hours and 24 cents during non-peak hours. That adds up to a good chunk of change. That's a lot of money, especially yeah. now when you see how cell phone prices are substantially, I mean mm -hmm. remarkably, mm -hmm. lower than that. So what was it that changed in the cell phone market that allowed that transition from business use to personal use? I, I would have to say in a word, competition. Uh, I mean, early on, uh, the cell phone carriers, cell phone manufacturers saw that they had a good thing going with the cell phones. And although the prices initially were really expensive, people still bought them. And along with the practical reasons for using a cell phone, uh, of course, thinking back to the 1980s, 1990s, a lot of people bought them for st uh, status symbols. It's like, if I have a cell phone, I must be really cool and I must be rich and, and such. So as other people started catching on to that, the demand for cell phones grew. And as the demand for cell phones grew, of course, other companies became involved and trying to get their own little niche into the, uh, into the technology, developed their own cell phones. And of course, now you have widespread use of uh, cellular technology and it's evolved tremendously in the years since. Now, and speaking about the evolution, let's talk about the evolution of the look okay. of the cell phone. Right. So what did we have? We started out we started with these with huge phones. The brick. Yes, the, the brick. The brick weighed, weighed almost a, a little over a kilogram. Wow. Yeah, and then and then I, and it was called uh, I think the Dynatech, and then it went. Imagine carrying that in your pocket. <laughs> well, they, for a while they called it a bag phone because yeah. you had to carry you had to it in its own that, little yeah. little right, right. little holster. But the but Motorola soon came out with a, a next in the series where it had a, made it smaller and then a flip phone and then it got smaller and smaller from there. Now, what about the significance of cell phones in the international market? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it is is a major player because because technology for uh, uh, landlines, which are the normal home telephone line systems in developing countries, for example basically non-existent. So uh, the communications um, uh, people in those countries thought, well, let's hop, hopscotch, let's, let's jump over, and instead of putting our money into a technology that may be dated anyway, let's spend the money and build a good cellular phone system. And that's why many developing countries are leading the world in cell phone use. Absolutely, you see it all over. Well, right. Rick, before we let you go, we wanted to talk about a video that's been circulating around the internet. Researchers at the University of California, Santa Cruz, have taught a California sea lion named Ronan how to keep a beat. Now, Rick, this, of course, <laughs> makes for some really interesting video. It and, certainly does. Yeah, and the sea lion apparently is the first mammal that's not a human to be able to be shown to be able to keep a beat. So. And, and evidently it's it's not just mimicry because they thought at first that 
the beekeeping by other animals other than humans was due to vocal mimicry. But this, this animal, this, uh, this Ronan, the sea lion, was, he dances better than me, first of all. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah, he's, and got, he's got his groove he's got, on. Yeah, he's got yeah. and, he, and the thing is, the researchers varied the beat and the tempo of the music, so, and he kept up with it. Yeah, actually, so, I think it was a she, actually, the sea oh, okay. lion. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, but... Uh, but 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 the Ronan is an amazing yes. creature, and and right now I understand her favorite song is Boogie Wonderland. Yes. From uh, <laughs> the Earth, Wind, and Fire, and the Emotions, but also Bringing like disco back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, see, again, I'm dating myself here, but I remember Disco Duck, but I don't remember Disco, disco Sea Lion. Sea Lion. Yeah. Well, yeah, such interesting things coming out. Right. We'll we'll watch for more with that. Rick Pinaleo again is our VOA Science World blogger. Thanks again, Rick, Thanks, for joining Alex. us, and be sure to check out Rick's blog at voanews.com. We are now going to take a break. Coming up, more science stuff when we talk the Higgs boson. You're watching On Assignment. In March, scientists in Switzerland announced that they are confident their experiments with the world's most powerful particle accelerator have finally turned up the long-sought Higgs boson. The discovery of the Higgs, often called the God particle, may provide clues to some of the most profound mysteries of the universe. The search for the Higgs began decades ago at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory near Chicago, Illinois. VOA's Kane Farabaugh has done a lot of reporting on Fermilab and Alex talked with Kane about the latest on the Higgs boson. Let's take a look. Kane, when we spoke last July about the Higgs boson, scientists were saying that they had discovered a Higgs-like particle, but they were stopping short of actually saying it was the Higgs boson. So what's changed since then? Well, they're almost saying that it is the Higgs boson. Some 200 scientists and other staffers gathered at Fermilab at 2 o'clock in the morning to watch the announcement from Geneva. Many of them have strong connections to the CERN experiment, using the Atom Smashing Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, to locate the Higgs boson. Scientists have spent hundreds of millions of dollars and tens of thousands of hours of manpower pouring over the resulting data. So what will be the practical applications of this? It's all very complicated. This is going to help scientists understand why and how we all exist here. Fermilab staff scientist Robert Roser says the Higgs boson is a particle that attracts other particles and explains how matter has mass. This gives clues to how planets and ultimately life is formed. But he points out his colleagues at CERN were careful to say they found a Higgs-like object but not the Higgs boson itself. It's a subtle difference, and so what they will do over the course of the next many years is to start to investigate all of its properties to see if it acts, if it smells, tastes, and behaves the way ex they expect it to. So what's the future for Fermilab, Kane, and, and what are the, their future projects that they're working on now? Technical division scientist Andy Hawker is working with physicists at Fermilab to build the next generation particle accelerator, one that will someday make the LHC obsolete. You know, what we're basically uh, planning to build here at, at Fermilab is basically the most powerful, not the highest energy, but the most, one of the most powerful proton accelerators in the world. Instead of particles being accelerated around a vast circle, as with the LHC, Fermilab's new linear device, housed in a facility about 31 kilometers long, would aim two particle beams in a straight line at each other, much like two bullets fired to collide with each other at the speed of light. The advantage of a, of a linear accelerator is that you don't have to, for example, keep those particles on a stable orbit. You can just, it's much easier, you can imagine, it's much easier to send something in a straight line than it is to keep it in an orbit in a circle. While the technology for the new International Linear Collider might be developed at Fermilab in the United States, engineering physicist Elvin Harms says if it is approved, it might not be built there. Right now, I'd say the odds on the, the Japanese are showing the strongest interest in hosting the International Linear Collider. But I would say that the term, you know, the first word international is important because this is necessarily going to be an international collaboration. The International Linear Collider project includes about 2,000 people from 300 universities and laboratories from 24 different countries. The estimated price tag 
between seven and eight billion dollars. You had a chance to actually go to um, this center where they're doing the research to Fermilab in the U.S. state of Illinois. What was that like? I mean, what is it like when you go inside? What was the energy like, the buzz around? Uh, what was that experience for you? It's a buzz of activity. These scientists are there pouring over these computers, looking at all of this data. And it's, to the average person, it seems to me that if I was a scientist, I would be highly energized and very excited by all the stuff that I saw that's going on there. As a reporter who, you know, again, uh, not being a physicist, I only have, you know, somewhat of a partial grasp of all of the stuff that they're trying to find out there. But even I'm a little bit surprised and I guess uh, uh, overwhelmed or even energized by being in the same room with these guys who seem to be excited by what they're seeing. And that was our VOA Midwest correspondent Kane Farabaugh. Thanks to Kane for that update on the Higgs boson. And now to a story from the American South. In 1993, three young boys were killed and mutilated in the city of West Memphis, Arkansas. Three troubled teenagers were convicted of the murders. Two got life in prison while the other was sentenced to death. Well, after more than 18 years behind bars, the men were released, but with a bizarre legal twist. The case is documented in a film by director Amy Berg, west of Memphis. VOA's Penelope Pulo interviewed Berg and the former death row convict. Let's start with a look at some of that report. Three young boys murdered in cold blood. Damien Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly, and Charles Jason Baldwin were accused of the crime. Their conviction, it turned out, was based on questionable evidence and false testimonies. In 1996, Paradise Lost was the first documentary to question whether justice had been served. There were just 15 years of evidence and new information. Amy Burke's 2012 documentary, West of Memphis, not only follows the case since then, but presents new evidence that focuses on Terry Hobbs, the stepfather of one of the three slain children. So you've actually met one of the Memphis Three. Right. Tell me about him. How was his demeanor in the interview? Incredibly intelligent man. He has studied law. He has studied so many things while he was behind bars. I was impressed. I, of course, cannot sit here and tell you, oh, by his demeanor, I can definitely tell you that he's innocent or guilty. He has a presence which emanates incredible intelligence, but I can also see how a lot of people could have seen him as a threatening presence. So far in the history of the state of Arkansas, I'm the only person who has ever walked off of death row. Uh, he could almost be his, himself like a heavy metal rock star. And I could see how he would not fit in a small city in Arkansas. And there was some uh, a number of celebrities lobbying on their behalf. Eddie Vedder's from Pearl Jam. You mentioned a few others. Johnny Depp and Peter Jackson, of course, who yes. gave so the how money. Did, how, do you think that played a role at all? In, uh, or did you get the sense that played a role in their release? I wouldn't say played a role in getting them released. I think they played a role in the court of public opinion. The film was not the one that discovered the DNA evidence. It put it on the large screen, but showing that there was an actual hair tangled in the shoelace of one of the murder kids and that hair belonged to the stepdad. Uh, this DNA evidence didn't exist back when the trials took place. We didn't even have DNA evidence. And you talked about the driving force earlier, the driving force behind getting these young men out of jail. Well, Peter Jackson was the driving force, the funding force, if you will, of the documentary West of Memphis, uh, which was made by Amy Burke. I think that the documentary stands alone as a reason to exonerate them and to prosecute the real killer. So we hope that the film can stand as that testament. While Hobbs has denied any involvement, in 2011, the state of Arkansas agreed to release the three, but not exonerate them. Damien Eccles, who had been sentenced to death by lethal injection, tells VOA that to get out of jail, the three had to take what is called the Alford plea. You're still maintaining your innocence. You're saying, I did not commit this crime, but you're accepting their guilty plea. And a lot of the reason for it is so that the state can't be held accountable for what they've done. As a result, says Eccles, he and the other two still bear the stigma of murder. Another presence in the whole driving force in the whole process was Damien Eccles' wife. They met 
while he was in jail, they got married. She made it her mission to help him, to free him. And she was the one who managed to gather more information of, on DNA evidence and drive actually the documentary from just being an informative piece into becoming really an investigative piece. Penelope, this is not your typical beat. This was kind of a crime story that also became a documentary. So how did you feel about meeting somebody who had been accused of murder and still technically was considered guilty of murder? Actually, I never saw myself as an entertainment reporter. I think film reflects life and influences life. Uh, I was lucky to have interviewed some people that are, um, have played an amazing role from, you know, from soldiers in Iraq to bullied children and kids who spoke how their fingers were broken in high school uh, on the basis of the documentary Bully and so many others. And I think this is where documentaries allow us to have a good peek at society. Not only is the state getting away with it, but the person who killed those three kids is still out there walking on the street. That was VOS film reporter Penelope Pulo speaking with On Assignment's Rebecca Ward. Well, now we move from films to TV. Television has become a big part of everyday life, but the way we view it has come a long, long way from the days of black and white sets. Now we see a continuing flow of new products hitting the market. And this year, manufacturers are setting a new, even higher standard for picture quality. VOA's Arash Aloui has the story. Most HD TVs now broadcast an image of around two megapixels. But soon, 8 megapixel screens will be in stores. Known as Ultra HD TVs, they come from all the top brands and could quickly take over the market. These Ultra HD TVs offer unprecedented picture clarity and detail. Scott Cohen, National Product Training Manager for Samsung, explains. You're looking at a timeless, uh, timeless design here with the frame around the TV. It actually has speakers built into the frame. The TV within the frame can slide up, down, tilt forward, tilt backward, so it really can fit any decor. This is an 85-inch UHD TV, and in addition to that, it's backlit LED with local dimming. So we're really going to give you the best in contrast, best in picture quality, best in resolution out of our set. But right now, there is not much content produced of that quality. In fact, the highest resolution that Karen Broadcast Channels support is 1080 pixels, which is half of what the new TV can display. LG, the other South Korean giant consumer electronics producer, released a new line of 3D TVs in March, which it introduced at this year's Consumer Electronics Show. The company has adopted a new technology, allowing it to produce 5-inch curved TV panels. Pete Hollenhorst, LG's national product trainer explains. You know, the, the big thing that we've all looked at, you know, the theme for CES for many years has been bigger, faster, and thinner. We talk about three credit cards thin for OLED technology. We look at style and design, but we also look at innovation. The new technologies offered by companies like Samsung and LG are exciting, but very pricey. But that is not likely to last. Experience has shown that prices for technology drop quickly as other manufacturers make similar products, creating more competition to lure consumers. Arash Aloi for VOA News, Las Vegas. So Ron, watching that piece, it kind of makes you wonder what it would be like to see our show on one of those uh, big televisions. <laughs> and that's of course a joke because I could say that I would like to see it on a cinema screen. Which would be even better. You yeah. never know. You yeah. never know what, uh, what the future may hold. Well, that is the end of our show. Join us again next time when we'll talk with our correspondent in Seoul about the high tensions on the Korean Peninsula. We'll also look at the state of media in Burma. And don't forget, you can watch all our episodes on VOAnews.com as well as Facebook and YouTube. For all of us here at On Assignment, thank you so much for watching and we will see you next time.